So it, whaling basically is just another form of commercial shipping, uh, fishing. It's a big fish, very, very big fish. As you know, that's what whaling basically is. You have two pictures in front of you on the first slide here. On the left, I'm gonna talk a little bit about it now, but much more later. On the left, you have a ship, actual whaling ship, called the Essex, E-S-S-E-X. And that is a, a whaling ship that is actually a prototype of Moby Dick's tale. I mean, you're learning more about that. In 1820, the ship was, was shipwrecked. Men were, were upended by a whale. They were on an island um, with no food to eat for a long time. They began, actually began, hate to say it, but I'm not vivid, but they're gonna cannibalize each other. That's how they survive. And five out of 22 people did survive. And I'll talk more about that later. But you, when you think of whaling though, like the picture on the, on the right, um, whaling is a very dangerous occupation. It has been, whaling has been outlawed in America now for over a hundred years, um, 1912 or 14, I think with the 14, with the last year that actual whaling ship oh. came out from Massachusetts and Provincetown in, um, in Provincetown. The, um, the whaling industry though was very, very big for many, many years. We're gonna talk more about that. So when did whaling actually begin? Well, whaling began, the concept of whaling, the more I read, the more interested I became uh, in fact, I'm working on a book now. I'm trying to do a generic history of maritime life on Cape Cod. And that a lot of a subspecies of that, would, a subset of that would be the whaling industry, just another form of fishing. You had all kinds of um, shipping, you know, fishing, you, have, um, you know, you had merchandising. And so it really was become a, a big project. The Vikings did a little bit of whaling, but they were in the seven, 800s. Um, they basically did not devour the whole whale they were known to take very long trips. They would come to North America. It would, there's, there's evidence that they came to uh, North uh, Newfoundland and maybe even New England's coast, Maine and even Massachusetts. Still some debate on that, but we believe they were here. But they would capture a whale, take the majority of meat from it and then just let it go, which was kind of sad, but that's how they survived. That's how the fishermen managed to get along. The Basque people were heavy into whaling. They were the first big group that were into whaling. They did it from the 800s to about the 1200s. Um, and they basically used the entire fish. We'll talk more about that. But in, in that, that year, you know, Europe was very much a Catholic institution. This is before the Protestant um, Revolution. So most of the countries in Europe were very Protestant, um, uh, Catholic. And as you know, on Friday in Lent, everyone had to have fish. So one of the reasons why Basque people would go out, they would catch the, with the whale and they would boil it and prepare it. They called it capois which is a very French word, just means a heavy kind of Latin stew. La de carême, carême is a French word for blubber. So forgive me, my first teaching job was in French. I used to be a French teacher way back on the many, many moons ago. So if my pronunciation sounds weird, it's my best attempt at being French. As I said, the Vikings would capture whales, but they would capture whales um, kind of on a random basis. It wasn't planned to be. If they were moving and they happened to see a big fish or well, any type, but particular whale would be very attractive because there's a lot they could do with whale. They can gain a lot of meat very quickly for their one catch. So they would surround it. Sometimes four or five boats would just surround it and they would harpoon it and do their very best to get, to get the meat on board. So on the right, you see a picture of this, actually an engraving of Basque people. On the right, this is an actual picture of Basque people in about the year 1100 who were, who were spearing a whale. You can see they had little tiny boats so we kind of kept surrounded. And then the men would literally uh, pull it into the side of the boat and then try to direct it to land. That's basically what they do. So they would wheel it in just like you do a fish and they were all little tiny boats. These were not big boats that they would use. Um, they would do their best they can to bring, to bring it to, to shore. So what kind of whales would they go for? They obviously wanted to go for oil sperm whales. Sperm whales was really, oil, oil whales would be the type of oil, uh, whales they would like to go. And the different types of big whales, as you know, we have the sperm whale, which is the very, it's the largest of all the toothed whales in the world. The blue whale is the biggest mammal on earth. They're over 100, sometimes 110 feet long. The right whale, and the reason they got their name right whale uh, they existed both in North Atlantic and South Atlantic is because when they were captured, they had a lot of buoyancy. Their head is very, very light and they would float. So if you kill the right whale, it would float to the top. So that made whaling particularly interesting and easier to do. 
or the blue and the, the sperm whale would be heavier. They could do it. I mean, they would, they would certainly use those on time, but the right whale by far would be the most prevalent whale that would be hunted. Finback whale would be another big whale that they would go for. And the humpback, not as much, but they were shorter. They were 55 feet. But the finback was almost as big as the, as the blue. So I would say the sperm, the blue, and the right were the big whales that people went to catch. Not true. Yeah. Not true? Okay. We could, well, there were different kinds of whales. Um, the physical features of whales, the whales are the largest of the adenocytes. Uh, they have the largest head in the brain of any mammal, 20 pounds. Uh, they can dive deeply. They can dive into a mile, almost a mile and a half, and stay underwater for long periods of time. Their skin is very thick. Their skin can be up to 14 inches, uh, up to 19 inches in, the blend, in, the, in depth. Now the tail of the, of the whale is proportionally a very large feature. Some of the whales um, have up to a 25 foot span of their whales. And you probably know this, but if you've ever gone on a whaling boat, some, especially around here, some of the, the whale people every day identify the whales by name. So I always wondered how they worked. And the way it did work was the whales on the fin usually had some kind of coloring, some marking. So some whales had white, some had a little bit of blue, some had darker. This guy may be a little darker on the outside edge than the inside. So based on their coloring, they would actually identify the whales as they, as they breached, as they went in the air and then came down again. It's hard to believe that human beings and whales are in the same generic species, but we're both mammals. We're both mammals. So we give birth to our live young. We both have large lungs. We need to breathe air on a regular basis. And the mothers provide milk to their, to their young. So you, know, you don't think of a whale and a human being kind of being in the same species, but if you look at the evolutionary part of it, whales have to exist above the ocean as well as below the ocean. So they really have the, the two species. And that's kind of the evolution theory that they, most, spe most species began in the ocean first. So was there whaling before the Europeans came to America? The answer is absolutely yes. We know that the Shunikok tribe, the Montauk tribe, they had a ceremony called Padawe. And we know that the Aquina over in the Mustard Vineyard, they also did a little ceremony as well. But the Shunikok probably more so. So the tribal leader would take the small boat out into the ocean. The chief would kind of go around, the, the, once they saw the whale spotted, they would go around it. The smaller boats would surround it. They would drag it to the shore with ropes. And as they were doing it, they would be singing songs and chanting and saying prayers and so on. And then bringing it back to a big celebration for the town. So it was a big ceremony, it was a big thing. They didn't do it always, they did it a couple times a year, but there definitely was whaling prior to the Europeans coming to, uh, to the New World. So who was the crew for the whaling boats? Well, it varied depending on the period of time that we talked about. In the very beginning, whaling kind of began around 1700 roughly, to 17 up to the American Revolution. They were um, mostly indigenous people, the great majority. I'd say probably almost two thirds of the crew were indigenous people. Um, the slaves on occasion, some of the people who had slaves, both from the North and the South would allow their slaves, mostly from North, they would allow their slaves to be a, to be a, a practitioner, to be a, a, a sailor on a whaling expedition. And the way that would work is that he, he, he got a little bit of money and his owner would get a little bit of money. So they shared some kind of pre-agreement that the slave would get some money. Once they were on board, the, the slaves were treated almost as equal to the white people. They were, they were, everything I've read said that they were given equal shares and given treated on a very equal basis. The indigenous people, not as much. The way they would do the indigenous people, basically the Wampanoas were the, the big group, basically. Um, they had a debt system. So if you live in Mashpee, primarily Mashpee, and you um, wanted to get food, you wanted to get some kind of provision uh, they would gladly give you it and say, you now owe us X amount of dollars. Want more food next week? Fine. They're, so they would keep on accruing debt. And then basically they would go to the young men, basically in the village, and to the parents and say, okay, you have the X amount of dollars that you owe us. Uh, you can pay that off by having a son be a, a whaler for three years or four years, or whatever it might be. And normally once they began doing that, there was no end to it. That whaling expedition went on for more than, typically they, if, if they returned, it was unusual, put it that way. Maybe the, maybe the indigenous people loved it and they wanted to stay there, but uh, well, for whatever the reason, it usually was very hard for them not, not to do it. The indigenous people were given a small stipend and they were also given uh, the most dangerous tasks. Everything I read about that time period 
Um, the indigenous people, they were, you know, the, the fatality rate on the whaleboat was much higher for, for them. They would have to climb higher sites and, and stay longer in the water and, and do a lot of the more dangerous activities, whereas the white uh, merit and the whale is at that period, not, not quite as dangerous for them. All right, so the next couple of slides, I'll be talking about why do we go for whale? Why was whale in such an important uh, situation? First thing we said is that baleen, um, there's all different parts of the whale, and every single inch of the whale was used. Once they caught a whale, there was nothing that really that could not be used for some product or another. The baleen is a fiber that's located in the mouth, um, and they could make different things out of that. They could make a, a doll, they could make a, Toothbrush, brushes, paintbrushes, they could do all kinds of things. The whale, the bone, the ribs and the whale, the vertebrae of the whale, often was used for carving. So they can bend and shape them to a small degree. So they can make furniture, you can make chess pieces, you can make um, furniture, you can do a number of things from whale vertebrae. Uh, it's very hard to do because it takes a lot of effort. It's not, they're not the most pliable, but they are usable. So they can. Many chairs and beds and so on have been made from, from the vertebrae of a whale. The big thing, of course, was whale oil. That was the big reason and the big money maker, so to speak. So when you think about how did America light their homes, you know, pre-revolutionary, revolutionary, and even up to 1830 or 40, well, originally candles, but then they had oil lamps. So oil lamps was very popular. And the whale oil would be what they used to fill their, their lamps. You could mix tar and oakum together into the whale and that would become a good corking material for building. Ambergris is a part of um, the whale oil and that was for medicine. So ambergris could be used for uh, an elixir, it could be used for uh, different things. I said it was good for acne, I said it was good for a number of different things. Spermachetti is another part of the whale. It's a very small waxy substance found usually in the head of the whale. From there, they made a lot of pomades, textiles, dyes, other types of medicines. Spermaceti is what made the whale buoyant. So once they were killed, um, if you are stung by bees, they say this is a real good thing to put on your body if you are stung by bees or if you have um, dry skin, a lot of things for hair preparation. So it's, it's interesting how over the years I found all of these different uses for the, for the whale. So as you can see, every inch of the whale was used one way or another. They used right from the head, right down to the tail. They would use the skin. Uh, they would do different, you know, different things in different parts of the whale. How did they catch the whale? Well, in the beginning, the normal thing would be some type of called shore whale. If, if a whale did normally kind of rush to the ocean shore, which did happen on occasion, that's called shore whaling. Um, it just kind of came up all by itself. Sometimes there were herders. Sometimes there were whales near the shore and ships would go out in, in, a, in a kind of organized manner and direct the shore, direct the whales into the shore. So they become stranded, they couldn't, couldn't get out. As early as 1692, I found some records that found um, the whalers had to, if you found a whale on the shore, you had to talk to your town. So if you live in Dennis or Yarmouth or, or whatever particular town you might be in, you would have to declare it. If you could dispose of it immediately, I guess they would define that as being um, within an hour, a couple of hours, maybe at the most, um, you could do something with that meat. But beyond that, you have to notify the town, identify what you found, where you found it, and then the town gets a, they get some share. <clears throat> they get entitled to that thing. So the rules in Dennis were different than the rules in other towns. Um, Brewster didn't become a town until 1812, so that's when Brewster became uh, part of it. Um, usually the uh, indigenous people could not use the whales. When, once the um, European people came, often you see the picture on the right is just a pilot whale, a smaller whale. They would, they would you know, they were, the rules are a little bit more la lax on those. So if a smaller whale came on board, people could use the whaling as they, as they, as they saw fit. They could, that's called an improvement. They could improve the whale, could basically cut it off. In 1690, Nantucket was called Sherborne, by the way. Um, and they hired, they wanted the kid to get commercial. Wasn't, wasn't many people living in Nantucket back then. They said, we need to get more industry here. We're kind of isolated. What can we do? And they said, me to become maybe a whaling center. So there was a famous, well, let me say, that's a colorful seller, whaler. His name was Jonah Paddock. Um, and what he basically did was he was a good trainer. He was a good uh, student of how to do whaling. So he basically gave lessons on how to the indigenous people, to the slaves, to the people, 
people from Europe would come over, indentured slaves would come from England and Ireland. They were to learn how to do whaling under his guidance. Now, he was a real colorful man. He was a bit of a drink or two and a bit of a carouser. So in the Nantucket people, many of them in those years were Shakers. I'm not Shakers, they were um, um, Quakers, Quakers. And, you know, drinking was never big for the Quakers. And they, um, he did like to spend, spend time in the bars. And he eventually was asked to leave because of his, his immorality, eventually. But he, he did work for 20 years and did train many of the people in Nantucket. So how do you get the whales from the ocean inside? So we talked a little bit, let me explain a little bit more. So there are three kind of basic ways to do it. One way would be if the whale just kind of came by themselves or was herded to shore. So the picture on your left, you know, there were some boats that could come on and, and, and kind of direct the whales to, to it. If you had to go out for just a little bit of time, a little bit of ways, you know, maybe like one day, two days, three days, that would be called offshore whaling. So those boats would go out, they, as you can see in the bottom picture, the whale will be attached to the side of the ship and they would drag the whale back into the shore. About 1815, 1820, they began a little more sophisticated. The picture on the right is called a tri-work. Tri-work is when they can actually cut the whales up into slices and bits and they can actually work on the whale's body on the ship. Much more expedient. So now the boats can go up for much longer periods of time. They can ca capture two, three, four, five whales in a clip but they could maybe spend a month, two months, even longer catching the whales. They can go out to, the, to where they need to go. There's some evidence that in the 1700s, men in North Atlantic whales were pretty prevalent here. Um, by, the, by, the, by the end of the century, they had to go either much more further north, either to the Arctic, to the, to the north, or down to the south, the south Atlantic to capture more whales. So those are the three principal ways to do it. They could herd it, they could attach it, or they could just drag it into shore. A part of a school, by the way, is also called a school of whales or gamma whales. We'll talk about that word later too. Gam, gam comes up again in our conversation in a minute. So in addition to the boats, every town in Cape Cod would have a couple of things. They would have a salt works. Many of you know in your town there would be a salt works. Um, that was very prevalent. Salt was another precious commodity up until the 1840s, 50s. Um, and the whale, you know, processing whale meat was a big thing. So the town would have their own tri works. So these are like factory type things that you could bring your blubber to, to, to here. They say that the smell, I have read some stuff that said that the smell was like in the air for a week, sometimes two or three weeks after the process was finished. And they would divide the ketchup. So the tri works would get something, the captain would get something, anyone involved in the process would get some degree of whatever, whatever they are able to process and eat themselves. Now, there are many related fields to whaling, too. When you think about whaling, whaling was a pretty popular thing all to itself. It was a subspecies, as, as I say, of, of maritime history, in addition to maritime fighting and, and fishing and, and other things, um, commercial shipping. Um, there are many people who did different jobs around it. So you see on your left a picture when the boats were not being used in the winter or whenever, they could do repair work. So the men would come on board, they could, they could patch the ships up, they could paint, they could haul it. Um, you needed coopers, you know, for the metal work, you needed sail weavers, you needed people to prepare food, you know, long food, dry, dry tax, things of that nature, things that wouldn't spoil over as they were along on sea, carpenters, traders, merchants, um, bankers. So there are a lot of different careers that were associated. In fact, the picture of the right is a picture of the whaling industry in New Bedford in the 1840s. So 18, you know, it, it was a lot of different people had different careers connected to whaling. So the whales themselves certainly were part of it, but they were not the only people that, that were involved with whaling. Let's just continue talking about Nantucket. Nantucket, over time, excuse my phone there. I'm not gonna pick that up, hold on. Um, in 1715, there were only uh, seven, there were only six ships. In 1745, there were 60 ships. So they got 600 barrels you know, in, the, in the early 1700s compared to 11 to 12,000 barrels in the mid century. 15 captains initially to 85 captains. So you can see Nantucket really became the primary mover of whaling. In fact, the picture there is like 18, oh, I think it's 18, I'm not sure, it's 1890. The picture of the whaling, uh, that's the uh, province now. Uh, 
Oh, that's the entire, that's the entire. The first um, big whaling captain, one of them, there are many, but one of them was a captain by the name of Benjamin Bangs, who lived in Brewster. And today's Brewster, anyway, back then it was something, some call something, it was part of tennis at that point in time. Um, that, uh, Jonas Paddock was the, uh, he was trained by Jonas Paddock himself. He himself was a slave owner, and they say he was very fair with his people. He wrote a log, you can read some of his work, it's in the library. Um, notes on it. He, he one day he said he saw all, over 400 blackfish. These are the pile whales that came on shore. So he he was a well-known whaler, and he that's basically what he specialized in. Some of the captains back in those days didn't specialize. They could maybe do whaling one day, then commercial shipping the next, then trade with Europe and do the rum thing. They could, they could do different different variations, but he specialized particularly in whaling. Bruce, uh, Bruce and Harwich came from, Bruce came from Harwich as possible. Well. All right, so after the, after the Revolutionary War, that kind of changed things. Um, beginning in 1771, there was a little bit of a spillover. Well Fleet became a bit bigger in the whaling industry. Not so much province down then. They became bigger like in the, uh, in the 1900s. I would say that late 1800s, 1880 to 1910 is when province town became much, much bigger in whaling. Um, Whale fleet had 30 whalers in, at the right before the beginning of the revolutionary. And about half of the town did engage in whaling in, in that time period. Um, one of the reasons why the population of the crew had a chain, because the native, the indigenous people had terrible, terrible diseases. You probably know, sometimes as much as half of the indigenous people were just wiped out. Between 1720 to 1750, almost half of the indigenous people in Cape Cod were just were no more. Uh, the epidemic was just similar, not so much, actually much worse than what we have now. So well and changed also by the American Revolution. It was also a big part of the American Revolution. Um, if you were a captured sailor, military, army, or navy, either or, you had three choices. You could go to jail for the duration of the war. You could join the British Navy. Or you could join the British whaling. Many, many people who were captured agreed to do British whaling. Prior to this, Britain uh, did not do a lot of whaling. Where they said, "Hey, there's money to be made. There's a demand for the for the whale oil." What are you talking about? Oh, well, I want to guess that some people doesn't don't agree. But we could we could discuss this at, in the end. But Britain did tri they uh, they tripled their fleet from 100 to 300 chiefs by the American Revolution. In the American Revolution, there were 6,900 people killed. Over 1,000 of these people came from Cape Cod alone. And that's the one of the reasons why Cape Cod, they could get a bigger crew. That's one of the reasons they, they moved to New Bedford. So why did New Bedford become the new whaling capital? A couple of reasons. One was a fellow named William Roch, who originally was a very wealthy man. He wanted a diverse labor force. Um, new Bedford also made a lot of candles back in those days. The candle maker to the world was known as the Rodman Candle Factory. He himself had a ship called the Dartmouth, which eventually became the part of the Boston Tea Party. So there was a couple of reasons why New Bedford became a very popular site for, for whaling. The Embargo Act of 1807 by Jefferson was a very, very unpopular act. Um, he put a heavy shipping tariff on cargoes to France and England. And it turned out to be a pretty much a major backfire. So many of the captains, the sea captains, and many of the whalers petitioned Congress to drop that tariff. 90% of the US merchandise was at sea but only a portion of it ever returned, or you, you, we made profit on only a small portion of what, what we actually traded. So he, he eventually did give in, he eventually did change the embargo act, he eventually did eventually give that act back to, uh, to the non-tariff people. So I would say the whaling industry was very big from 1820 to 1856, that was a major, it was not the only time, but obviously it was a major time. There were, we know there were at least 900 active whaling boats that hunted worldwide. Most of those were American. Uh, don't forget the Industrial Revolution kind of began too in that era too, 1830, 1840. So a lot of textiles, shoes, cotton, Lawrence Mills and that kind of thing. Um, so we were kind of in the, in, the, in the forefront of it. Whaling was one of the biggest industries in America. People could make a lot of money. There were sales back then was a million dollars back then, which, which was really a lot of money, for obviously in that, that economy in that period of time. So the fleets in the eight, 
They could kill 800, 800 whales per year. They could produce over 100,000 barrels of sperm oil and baleen by the millions of pounds. You can talk a little bit now about some of the people who are um, kind of famous uh, whalers. I'll talk about Prince and Absalom Boston. Um, first, I'll talk about Prince Boston. Prince, Prince Boston was a member with a mailing of a, uh, a whaling crew. And he agreed to do the whaling under two conditions. Number one, he could keep a little bit of money as he would accrue as being a whaling uh, participant, a whaling maritime person, and also would get us freedom at the end. So at the end of a couple of years of work, um, they kind of reneged on the deal. He went to court in Massachusetts and he won. Prince won, he sued his owner for his profits and for his freedom from, from slavery. And he was awarded both. He actually received both the salary as well as his freedom from slavery. So he did, he did win this case. Must have been a real big effort uh, for his day to have done that type of thing. Um, Absalom Boston became, a, his nephew became um, a natural sea captain himself. He was a mostly black crew. As I said, black people could, could move really freely in the whaling industry. They become harpooners, which are like a higher rank, so to speak. They could become captain, first mate. They could become anything. There was a lot of freedom. So Absalom Boston came out of Provincetown, and he, uh, he himself commanded several ships. The one, the name that probably most people know about is Edward Penniman. And you could visit his house. I strongly recommend you do that. If you go to East Ham, you go to the National Park Service, you go to Fort Hill, and his house has been recently renovated. Um, and it's funny because if you look at today's standards, it looks like a nice, quaint house. But for his day, he owned a great chunk of Fort Hill. You know, there's not most, a good part of the land there. Uh, very affluent man. He went to, he went to work as a, as a whaling shipper at the age of 11. He went to New Bedford. Uh, he married Betsy Knowles, and she was often a participant in the boats. She was often the first mate, or if not the first mate, a cook or a, an important person on the boat. Um, she didn't go on every trip, but quite a few. There's a story that he had captured some bears one time, and he, they were little tiny bears when he first captured them, and the son thought it'd be fun to bring them home back to East Town, and he did, but he was surprised because the bears became a little raucous on board, and it didn't work out too well, unfortunately. He retired at the age of 53, he made a lot of money. Um, he did not like paying taxes, local or state taxes. He was, he was on record of saying, I would have held maybe one or two more years, but I will not pay my share to the government. Uh, so, but, but it's a great house to go through. I and mean, if you want to take that tour, I strongly recommend you, you do that. Another captain would be Captain Augustus Englefield. He was, was a black captain, very popular, well known in town, active until 1902. Uh, he also had mostly a black crew, but it was all kinds of people on his crew. He would have different, different kinds of crew members. A fellow who made a lot of money on whaling was a fellow named Jonathan Bourne. Named the town of Bourne is named after him. So you, even beginning at a small age, you know, a very young age, we take maybe one tenth of one share of a, a whaling percentage of a boat, and then he doubled that and doubled that and kept on buying shares of a whaling boat. Eventually, he became uh, owner, a complete owner of eleven different ships. Very involved in politics. Mr. Mr. Bourne is very, very heavily involved. He was friends of the governor Oliver Ames at the, at the time. In fact, he was on the Republican nomination committee in at the time of Lincoln, 1860. And he wanted Lincoln to be the president over Chase, was very close. Chase was deemed to be very popular at the time. So one of the things that he did, Bourne did, was he published the Lincoln Douglas debate, which was a uh, anti-slavery, um, Lincoln, of course, anti-slavery, Douglas was a little more pro-sentiment, um, pro-slavery sentiment. So that actually gave Lincoln more prominence. He was not that well known prior to that. And that's, they believe that he was, this man was very important for Lincoln getting the nomination for the presidency. Another thing that people may or may not know, there was a lot of preview, a lot of precursor to Moby Dick. There was a whale called Mocha Dick, which was an actual whale. The book was published in 1876, but he, he himself was a, uh, a whale that was between 1800, 1820, 18, he actually died in 1830. Um, he had a very large whale. He ran deliberately into a dozen ships. He had a very big, large white head, as most whales do. White barnacles covered his head. 
big ram into them. And he was described as having as white as, his hair as being as white as wool. So that's, that's, that. that's one of the precursors to the Moby Dick story. Now, if you're of a certain age, and I am of that age, I remember the classic comic books. I just remember reading Moby Dick, Ivanhoe, Robin Hood, you know, the various books that were out at the time. Um, but I used to love reading these books. Um, we know that Melville in 1840 became uh, his first ship experience was above, above, above the uh, Krishnit, the sail of Ellen boat. And when he was the seventh month out at sea, we know that the two ships passed, that the Krishnit and Lima passed. I mentioned the word gamming before. Gamming is a term that when shippers, when big fisher, fishermen get together, they would stop and have a session, like a talking session, basically, with a social discourse. So we do know that he spent two or three days talking to William Chase, who was on board the Essex. Remember I mentioned the Essex at the very beginning. Essex was a whaling boat. Um, so they, he, the Essex was a ship that was, that was ran by, um, by Mocha Dick and the, you know, all the, the boat was completely pulverized, that people had to, uh, had to seek refuge. And so, Mo, uh, so Herman Melville took all of his notes down. A lot of his, his, his material based on his discussion with, um, with William Chase, the captain, one of the captains. He was actually not a captain, he was a, I think he was very young. I think he was a cook on the ship at the time. Now, there are a few other things that we associate with whaling. We associate, of course, um, Scrimshore, of course, with, with that. Um, we have to be very careful. A lot of people claim they have legitimate Scrimshore. But legitimate, I mean, real truth, Scrimshaw would be made, you know, on the, on the, on the texture of a whale tusk. Um, so you can buy it, but you guys to be really careful. There could be not, uh, not a lot of knockoffs. A lot of people claim to be legitimate, and they're really, they're really not. So. But they are, they are beautiful pieces of work. They say that the sales had time at night. That's partially true. Depends on the strip was. Sometimes they're really, really busy. Sometimes they're kind of a week where they had not as much to do. Um, some of the stories I read too, they were actually courses. They would actually teach the men how to read, teach the men how to uh, navigation. They would teach men. So there are different things that they could do over and above that activity. So why did the whaling industry kind of pander out? Um, I would say there's a number of reasons. Uh, number one, it became a, the whale became an, an endangered animal, endangered species. So in 19, so that was something that they would, people were told not to use that at all. Obviously the, the need for whale oil was nowhere near as popular. You had electric lights, but then you had kerosene lamps, you had all kinds of things. Uh, the Arctic region was a very difficult region to do whale, and that was pretty much where whaling had to go. It had to go way up to the, to the Arctic region to do, to do whale, and that was a very dangerous thing. Um, we know today that there are three countries that do permit whaling. Probably not too actively, but Japan is very active. Norway and Iceland also allow whaling. So beyond that, uh, we don't know too much more. We do know, though, that the whaling industry was uh, very, very popular for that, for that time period. Okay, so I'll, I'll end it there, and then I'll open up for questions, comments, concerns, whatever you like to do. Actually, yeah, there are a couple that were typed. And then after I ask those, you know, we might let people just raise their hands because I don't, sure. you know, sure. I think we'll be able to do that. But someone asked if you had any information about the shipbuilding here in Falmouth for whaling ships and the Falmouth ships that were locally owned. Yeah, Falmouth had a very big ship center. They had a, um, what do you call it? The Falmouth, oh, it's not coming to me. But they had one of the very large, it wasn't just whaling ships, they used to make a number of ships was one of the largest in the Northeast, as a matter of fact. It wasn't there for terribly long, but uh, there was a period of time when the Falmouth fleet was developed. And I'd, I'd say at one time they had up to 12 to 15 ships being built uh -huh. simultaneously. That's a lot. And, oh, someone wanted to, to mention that the Inuit in Alaska do whaling today as well? Oh, it could be. It could be. I'm sure a lot of countries do. But as far as, you know, big time like commercial whaling, probably, I would guess it's not as, Prevalent. It's not like they're not, they're not selling the product. I wouldn't think it's probably more for local consumption. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions either on the chat or you can just unmute yourself if you like at this point. Yeah, that was a fascinating. That's been, this has been fascinating. It's very interesting. 
Yeah. It was, it was interesting for me, you know, as I began reading some of the things. Well, I guess what, what a couple of things that to me jumped out, two or three things. One is, is how active Cape Cod was during the American Revolution. I did not realize we were kind of the major push behind. I know we did the Sons of Liberty and all of that, but you know, the 7,000 people killed, 6,800 people killed. We had over a thousand just in Cape Cod alone. Mm -hmm. And many of them were real, really, I should go to the cemeteries. I, I just, every, I, I've been to five or six, I could go to more town cemeteries. And you see many, many flags of American patriots and people who actually in the revolution, you can see the bodies, you know, they they were, their remains are interred there. So it just, oh, that's, that's fascinating to me. The other thing that kind of jumped out to me too is like um, how it kept on shifting, how the whaling kind of, you know, went from Nantucket to kind of the wealthy to, you know, to kind of down, down to New Bedford, then eventually back to Provincetown again. Um, and it's all because of the labor force, it's based on economy. It was interesting to me too that the white people, I hate to say the white the European people, only in like 1800 really began to realize like, God, you can make serious money, some really good money out of this. So that's how, you know, between like 1820 to 1850, that's when the, I'd say the, the heart, so to speak, of the whaling industry was. And that's when people, you know, the, the, the capital, capital venturists of the day uh, would, would invest their money, that people would, you know, they'd build ships, they'd send men out, they knew what they were doing. Um, right here in town in Brewster, there was a, uh, a John Sears, Henry J. Henry Sears, the same fellow who built the Provincetown Monument. He was well known, he was, he hired like 11, different sea captains almost every year to do different things. Most of them are whaling. Uh, so he had a lot of connections and he, you know, it was just everywhere. It's not just one town. I'd say Yarmouth was big, Dennis was big. Um, you know, the, the only town that probably not so much maybe born itself is born had Jonathan Bourne. So he, he put the money up for all of these adventures. But actually every town in the Cape had a pretty heavy uh, reaction or a connection to the whaling industry. Yeah, I live down Cape Moore, and I've been to that place, Fort Hill in East Ham, many times, and I didn't even realize that there was a connection there about that big house. Yeah, it's a great walk. I love that walk. I don't know if you take that little trail that you take. It's kind of a boardwalk, and then on the edge of the ocean. He owned, he owned a lot of property there. He owned acres and acres and acres of land. And his wife, I guess, one thing I just realized, too, his wife was kind of a really independent woman. She took charge of the boat. He would sometimes just take a nap, or when he was injured a couple of times, like a week at a time, she would just take full control. She was a woman way ahead of her time. She was actually you know, the, the, the captain, unofficial captain, very, very often in that, in that boat ride. Wow. I've got a couple more questions. Um, someone, someone says that they were still whaling here in the United States till 1972. It could be. There was some, yeah, even in 46 to 72, there was some small sale whaling, but there's very limit. It had to do like certain size, only certain locations, couldn't see 330 feet whales. So yes, the answer is yes, technically, but not not the large scale commercial whaling that, that, that we've been talking about here generically. Okay, and I have someone asking, do you recall your source for the illustration on a Cape Cod shore of whale processing with the structure in the background? One of your slides. Top of my head, I could, if, it's, if you want to send me an email, I could certainly check. Top of my head, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, actually. Um, you know what, it probably was. But Rebecca Dalton, she is a librarian at the Maritime part. You know, at the Cape Cod, the Four Seas College, they have a Maritime History Library. I'm pretty sure it was one of her books. The exact, exact book, I can't believe. If you, if you email Rebecca Dalton at the Four Seas Community oh, College. Oh, yeah, yeah. Do you mind if I do you mind if I put your email out there, Michael? No, that's fine. That's great. Yeah. Do Any that. sort of questions or comments, I'd be glad to talk to people. Yeah, let me put that right through right now. Yeah, I am familiar with the Four Seas Library too. That's great. Uh, all right, so here I'm putting Michael's email out in the chat if anybody's looking for it. Yeah. Um, and, um, let me mention one more thing, so if you don't mind. Yep. The reason I got into the thing at all, and, and to begin with, I live in Brewster, and I'm a golfer, so I play golf at a captain golf course. So mm -hmm. as you know, there are two golf courses here. Each hole is named mm -hmm. after a captain, and there's a, a big sign, you know, Captain Walker, Captain Smith, Captain Barnaby, you know, Payne, and so on. So I said to the to the uh, to the manager, the golf manager, I said, Mark, has anyone ever done a history? He says, Never. And I said, Would you mind? So my first little book with a book, and you can get it from the Brewster Library, maybe more, but at least the Brewster Library, uh, the history of the Cape Cod Sea Captains. So once yeah, I began doing that, that was, that was interesting. From there, my, my, my knowledge of the Cape kind of expanded, saying so every town has a connection, not just Brewster, every town has a connection to maritime history. So maybe my next book will be the maritime history of Cape Cod, perhaps. Yeah, it's interesting because I've been a librarian at various libraries on the Cape and people ask that, a lot. I've, I've had a few people come in and say, do you have any books about Cape Cod Sea Captains? 
Mm -hmm. So it's definitely a topic of interest. I know, you know, and again, there aren't that many, so I've always had trouble finding, or they're very specific to one town. Most of the ones that have been published. And so where did you do some, I'm just curious to find out more about where you did your research. I know you did do some at Four Cs. Yeah, books, basically books. I went to the libraries, I went to the Provincetown Public Library, I went to um, Wall Street Public Library, you know, well, Truro, uh, yeah. Brewster. So a lot of libraries, you know, but it's hard because at this time, as you know, this time of the pandemic, you, you have to put in a request, you have to find out, say, sometimes you don't even know what the name of the book is because you have to go and scan the books or the shelves to figure out. So it was really a little challenging for me to get some of this material, but I was able to persevere and to, and to find out more. Yeah, no, this has been very interesting. Yeah, we appreciate this. Does anybody have any more questions? And again, you absolutely can email Michael. He's, I put his email address out there. And we should, and we do have his book available in Clams, I know. Is that what it is, the history of Cape Cod Sea Captains? Um, the, the Brewster Captains, the Captain, I think it's called the Meet the Captains. That's, that's, the, that's the first one I did. Meet the Captains with us, the Brewster Sea Captains. But either way, you, you definitely have some books, and I'm sure that we have them in clams, whatever. Yeah, I'm sure. yeah, we've had a few people saying thank you for such an interesting presentation. And we'll definitely, we, you know, you're welcome to come back again if you have any more <laughs> lecture as you do your research. Yeah, that's kind of, like I said, that's kind of a subset of the whole genre, so to speak, of maritime history. So you could do something on maritime war, you know, the Revolutionary Civil War. You could do something on War of 1812, the big... You could do something on like commercial fishing, you could yeah. do something on like boat building, engineering yeah. of boats. So yeah, there's yeah. depending on what, what aspect you want to cover. There's a lot of aspects of the maritime history that you, you could look into. Yeah, definitely. And okay. sort of the, the last thing I'll say too, you know, what surprised me too, I thought like Moby Dick was kind of like a creation of the imagination of Herman Melville. Mm -hmm. And the more I found out about it, I was like, not so much. I mean, he certainly was creative. He was one of the greatest books of all time, certainly. But there's a lot of precursors to this. I mean, the finding out about Mulca Dick, which is a great big whale that attacked boats, you know, was going, you know, the 1820s on four, full bore, surprised me. Because then he talked to that captain and found out more data. And that, that was how he kind of derived this history of the, you know, Captain Ahab and the great white whale. So oh, someone that. asked too if you'd been to the New Bedford Whaling Museum yourself. Yeah. Yes, I have. Yeah. That's, that's really worth a trip. The great, great, they have, I haven't even gone, they have archives I could go. I haven't even gone through their archives yet. They have a lot of logs and shipwrecks and you know if you want to do research i haven't even gone through them yet but, yeah you know, and i know you had, and you had told me that you've it's more of a recent interest that you've started researching since you lived here in the past few years yeah i mean i've only began doing this like the last three years actually yeah but, so that's quite a bit of research for a few yeah. years so i've enjoyed it it's been fun for me yeah that's great yeah we've had a few more people say thank you and i wanted to thank you again for coming and volunteering your time for this that was wonderful Okay, so I'll come back and do something else again, perhaps. All right, take care and every and have a good day, everybody, and take care. All right, take care now. Bye bye. Good night. Good night.